in case you didn't know this and you should know this by now, don't mess with the grandparents. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. Folks, I got to say, don't mess with any of the grandparents in this movie, okay? They are all dangerous. Do not mess with them. That's all I'm saying here. Um, look, uh, I'm very happy to have back in the series, and it's been just a hot minute, uh, writer-director Thomas Bazooka to talk about today's film, Let Him Go. You know, it's 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 been a long time. Thomas was in the podcast early on when we first when we first started out, and uh, he he was he was a great guest, and we just somehow didn't connect on the other films that he was on, and it was really good to have him back, and uh, you know talk about his latest film. You could see Let Him Go anywhere that you could you could rent a movie online. So I highly recommend you go check it out because there's there's great performances and it's a, it's a rock solid adaptation as well. You know Thomas was very forthcoming about his creative process and especially the lengths at which he went to adapt this book because he really did change the narrative around in, in ways that were actually kind of surprising, I found, but but really worked and benefited the movie as well. So I hope you check out Let Him Go. And speaking of things to check out while you're surfing around online, I also hope you stop by and check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You can read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. You know, if you've never read us before, check out our free issue. That's the best barometer of who we are and what we do. We're the only magazine in the world that publishes screenplays in their entirety, along with interviews with the screenwriters. So we also interview directors, actors, producers, novelists, playwrights, and comic book writers. So Storytellers is our goal. And uh, if you'd like what you see over there, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That will save you $5 off a subscription over at Backstory.net. And it'll also work for your um, iPad credentials, which you'll get at Backstory.net. But you could only use the coupon code at Backstory.net. So it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners support my passion project. So thanks for considering. And of course, folks, as some of you are listening to these interviews on iTunes and Spotify, remember you could also watch these interviews over on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. So come on down and see what we look like when we talk about screenwriting. We're happy to have you. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our conversation with writer-director Thomas Bazooka about his latest film, Let Him Go. Okay, Tom, it's good to see you. How's it going? Good. How are you, Jeff? Good. So, you know, it's been a fast minute. Uh... The last time we saw each other was in the Zanuck Theater on the Fox lot for the Family Stone way back a million years ago. We did last a Q&A. Tuesday. Last yes, Tuesday. We, yeah. we did a Q&A way, way back. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's an interesting place to start, you know, and then I want to hear hmm. your breaking in story again. But what, sure. what would you say all these years later that your your biggest lesson was on the Family Stone? You know what? We celebrated. It's the 15th anniversary this year. And right. so and we were. Anyway, that there was a moment where Fox, right before we finished the deal with Michael London, when Fox there, they thought maybe it could not take place at Christmas, that it would be, they were looking right. at their release calendar and there were so many movies at Christmas and they're like, could it, and I, and I, and I was, I promised them the thing that they were afraid of was the thing they would love later because um, it would play every year. And I was prepared to walk away from it. And they were like, we're not, we, we can't do it. We can't do it unless you change it from Christmas. And I said, sorry. And then got a call like two minutes later and they're like, it's fine. Um, so <laughs> that's right. I remember so that. The, so the lesson, the lesson is stick to your guns. Yeah. Well, I mean, right. and, the, and the power of no, I mean, you wrote a script that is set at Christmas for a very specific reason with all these mm -hmm. folks coming together for the holiday. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, like which 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 isn't. I, I don't want to tell stories out of school. Which isn't to say that my executives weren't completely supportive all the way through. So, but but could you set it in a submarine? Could it be a musical? Yeah, exactly. Kind of. Kind of. Um, well, so you know, yeah. from whence does that help? Tell us your breaking in story. Did you did you study this? Did you go to school for writing? Did you go to school for directing? I, I did not. I was. I went to school. I went to Parsons School of Design for fashion, actually, and then worked for Ralph Lauren for a decade um, designing stores. I didn't do the fashion thing. I designed stores all over the world and loved it, but had always been obsessed with movies. And would you say that that, that meant you were designing like like kind of like your school time was like interior design? Was that kind of the focus of your study at Parsons? No, the, the 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 focus of study was actually fashion, and oh, it was fashion. Okay, so it was fashion, 
and then technically you ended up interior design. So I could have seen you going into like production design or something like that after, which, which was always sort of a lurking idea I had. Um, I, you know, when my, my, I would say my prized possession when I was 14 years old was a copy of the Hitchcock Truffaut book that I would just go over and over and over. Amazing book. Yeah. But I, I, anyway, I wanted to, I mean, it's ridiculous. Try my hand at film. And so I wrote a script, which, you know, took me longer, not writing than writing, but uh, which was the first movie I made big Eden. And that was the first day. The first day on set was the first day I'd ever been on a movie set. That's, that's fantastic. And just jump, by the way, in, jump get in the deep end, get in the deep end. I, I love, I love yeah. Hitchcock Truffaut as a book. Yeah. And just for you as a fan, two things, there is a documentary that somebody put out yeah. that took archives of the tapes of the actual conversation with the translators. So you could see subtitles. Yeah. And then some people have actually released bootlegs of all the tapes, which, includes, oh. which includes something, some stuff that's not even in the book or in that documentary. So just in case it sounds like you're a geek for Hitchcock Truffaut. Uh, I've seen the documentary. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Look, look around on the internet. You might find some other stuff. Well, so to, you know, your next film was Monte Carlo. Um, what, yeah. was, what was your biggest lesson there? If somebody pays your way to France, enjoy it. <laughs> I think I, I was Wait, so advice. worried about, I wish I'd enjoy, I wish I'd enjoyed it more. Um, been a little bit more in a little bit more in the moment. Um, so was it, was it too stressful? It was very stressful. I would also say if, um, you know, a lot of it was anyway. Yeah, it was, it was, it was stressful. And we were one of the first productions at a new facility, um, sound stages in Budapest. And, you know, it's just, it was a bad budgeting thing and we were trying to replicate, when you're shooting in the, in essentially the social housing um, in Nice, there is such a thing as apartment buildings in Texas, you know, you're just, something's, something's turned inside out. That's, but, that's a little crazy. What was your yeah, most surreal yeah. moment on that set? Since it sounds yeah. like it was a crazy time. Do, was there yeah. like just a memory yeah. that you have a flashback of? Well, I, yeah. And I, you know, at the here, I'm going to talk about the things I really loved were, uh, Leighton Meester. I just, I'm, I'm such a believer. I love that girl so much. Um, and Luke Bracey was this, this young Australian actor who's great and Pierre Boulanger. Um, and I just, I loved all the French people it was great. Um, so it was good. And the food was good once we got to Paris, but we didn't spend a lot of time in Paris. Gotcha. Well, you yeah. know, just, just before we kind of gear things up towards, towards today's film, your, your yeah. last film, the Guernsey literary and potato peel pie society, yeah. um, you know, it, 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 I guess opened up some doors towards today's film because it's a period piece as well. Um, what mm -hmm. was, what was your, your biggest lesson on that? It really, it was the first adaptation I'd done and um you know what's funny? I guess the lesson the lesson is the same as the one on Family Stone. Stick to your guns. Um, they had a script that was good, but I felt like they had this romantic. They were trying to lean into this romantic comedy thing. It's Paula Mazur who was the producer, and she was the producer on Let Him Go because we had a great working relationship. But I kept saying, "You're telling the wrong. You're telling the wrong story. It's make it's a story about an orphan finds a family." And that's got to be the thread because it's a, there's so many threads in that book and you just needed one sort of unifying principle. Um, and I really fought everybody and stuck to my guns. And I think I was right. What did you learn about adaptation? Because we're going to be talking about that just in, in a minute here for, for let them go. But what'd you learn about adaptation of a book on, on that film? Um, I would say it was process. It was really just figuring out the, how, what was going to work for me. Cause I'm, I'm very organized. I have cards. I do all that sort of stuff. And so it was, um, going through the book, highlighting things, creating a document just based on the highlighted thing items, reading the book with a deck of three by five cards and just anything that was of interest became a card that went into a bucket 
and then, you know, spread it all on the living room floor. And you sort of figure it out that way. It was, um, and, and, you know, the voice of the book, figuring out, because that was an interesting one because it was, it's an epistolatory novel. So there are all these letters from different characters and these different voices. And it was trying to figure out a single voice for the, for the piece um, and the spirit of it. I, I love all things note cards and hearing about note cards. So once you get them out yeah. of the bucket, you get them on the floor. Do you then celebrate it? Do you, did you have categories like character beats, story beats? Was, was that kind of the way you did your cards? Tell us more about your carding. No, it becomes, it's a, um, it's, it's a roadmap, if you can think of it that way. And so it's, you know, here's the beginning, here's the end. This is probably in the middle. And you just start to shape it and move the cards around and figure out, you know, how to tell this, the sequence of the narrative. Okay. Well, yeah. so let's talk about Let Him Go, to today's yeah. film. You know, when did you discover the, the, the novel by Larry Watson? Uh, when it when it came out, which I'm going to get the date wrong, someone will someone will fix it. Um, it's 2014, something like that. But I, you know, pulled it off the bookshelf at the bookstore, and I had been I was familiar with Larry's work. He'd written a wonderful book, Montana, 1948, and so I'd been a fan. So I recognized his name, read the book, and sort of I loved. It had what I like. It's it's sort of like Family Stone. Like Family Stone is a Christmas comedy, but what's interesting to me is the story about the mother who has cancer and the and it's the family. It's the story of a family's last Christmas with their mother. And this had this thriller narrative, but was an opportunity to tell, you know, illustrate this, paint a portrait of this marriage, um, this long marriage between. George and Margaret, Diane Lane and Kevin Costner's characters, and their the way they deal with grief, the individually and then as a couple, the way they navigate all that um, was interesting to me. And so, tell us about pursuing the rights. Give us insight into that process and how that worked for you. Yeah, it was it, um, a little fits and starts. Um, somehow, I got in touch with Larry. And because I had a couple of questions, I wanted his blessing. I reversed the direction of the journey from, anyway, they go from Montana to North Dakota now, and it used to be the opposite. And I wanted to change, the novel takes place in 1951, and I wanted to change it to 63. So just, it felt like the, you know, the last days of Camelot, the, before the fall of, you know, the fall of grace in America. And that felt right for the, the Kennedy's president, you know, it's not going to end well. And as the story doesn't end well anyway. And then I had worked with Paula Mazur on Guernsey and that was a great experience. And she said, you know, what do you, anything you want to do, let's do. And I said, get, let's get the rights. I'll write it on spec. And uh, cause we wanted to control it. And then, it all came, it came to, in the scheme of things. It came together very quickly. Um, like we wrote that we had a script. Diane came on, and uh, and then Kevin's schedule opened up with Yellowstone, and then he and I met him, and we were off to the races. Well, so you know, you said you changed the states. Why did you change the states? The, like, the states it, in the novel. It is. It starts in North Dakota, and they drive to Montana, and. I just, I like Montana <laughs> and okay. I liked the idea that the black ledges were sort of from this more verdant bucolic setting and have to go to hell to get the grandson back as opposed okay. to starting there and going to Montana. Well, so what changed about your adaptation process on this? Obviously, were you going through the book the same way, highlighting note yeah. cards? Tell us what yeah. changed. Yeah, no, it, it, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Um, and I, I also, I just did or around the same period I did an adaptation of Anne Leary's novel, The Good House. And it was this, the same process. When you card, you know, people have yeah. a lot of different ways for carding. Do you give mm -hmm. a certain amount of cards per act? Do you, do you split it no. up in which, no? Okay, so it's just however many you need. It's however, it, it's, it, I, I don't, I don't, it's, it's a, uh, you know, for me, the writing is, it's a process of attrition. <laughs> and so you, you know, start 
as big as you can, and then you whittle it down and whittle it down. And, and you, you know, often, you know, you've got two cards and, oh, well, that could happen in this scene with this person. And so things be, events can conflate. Um, and it was also sort of when, once you get it all laid out, you're sort of like, well, I don't need any of this section. Um, but it then, you know, once I've got it, it goes up on a board and I work off that board and I do, it can change and often does, but I, I never start the car without a map on family said, you know, I do, I don't know if it still exists. There was a, it was called Dramatica pro it was some software thing. The name. Yeah. And it actually as a, tool it was great it just had one of the ugliest interfaces i've ever seen um for a software but it entered the, the i you create a matrix of character relationships and that was really interesting to me and i and i did use that for family stone um and it so you sort of you know you have an understanding of i i need to know how you know each person's first encounter with a different person and their last encounter and you know how you how you start and how you dismount and so i know all of that before i before i begin but i don't do a for, i don't do a formal treatment document i that kill that actually i've tried to do it a couple times and it derails me um i it just it, it's it lets some, some of the steam out of the pot when you really need a head of steam to get in there, or at least I do. Well, so tell me this, when you sit down to write, after you've, you've done your carding, yeah. you're ready to write, um, mm -hmm. do you give yourself a page count to hit each day or do you go for a certain amount of hours each day in your writing habit? It's hours. It's, it's, uh, it's hours. Um, I wake up and write and then get stuck and go for a run. And, um, and then I, anyway, I like to write at home in the morning and then I go to the library. Um, it, it's been, I moved back to New York from LA about five years ago and it was, and I spent the first year trying to figure out what my, what my writing environment was going to be and was part of a writer's room and different stuff. And I, anyway, New York city public library is great. Well, so tell us about that. Why do you, why do you switch it up? I, I like the idea of changing the atmosphere of, of where you're writing. Tell us, tell us why you decide to go public, even though you start private in the morning. I, I start private because it's, I'm sort of excited after I wake when I'm, I'm a morning person and I wake up and it's, and I'm excited to do it and get to it. And then if I were to stay home, I would not write. <laughs> it's what happens in the afternoon. I'm, I'm not terribly disciplined, but if you're in public, you gotta, you no, know, it's funny because I've, I've heard that from a lot of writers. It's, it's the kind of the concept of accountability in that, which, it. in yeah. which, you know, some writers, you, you go to a library, some writers just go to a coffee house and yes, there's writers that just stare off at the coffee house. Cause there's a lot of distractions as well, but yeah. some people say they eaves, eavesdrop on conversations, you know, and are inspired for dialogue and they just feel more accountable if they're out in public. So that's, yeah. that's definitely something for you, I guess. It, it, it is. It's also, I, this is a weird, it's a sentimental sort of thing. It's, I go to the library for the performing arts at Lincoln center, which is a beautiful space in and of itself. And that feels inspiring. And it's across the street from Juilliard. And so you see all so many, and there's theater and there's so many young people and artists around that, that, it puts a little wind in my sails also. That's great. So how many hours a day would you say it is when you, when you write between those two places? Um, I think it's like maybe three to four. Okay. During a, on a first draft. Um, once you have a first draft, you know, I can go all day long. It's just that horrible sort of, you know, getting the basic shape of it is the hardest part. Right. You feel you need more breaks to kind of think about it offline. It's exhausting. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's so, it's horrible. It's so, it's exhausting. Well, so of course we're, we're yeah. sitting here in the middle of this 
you know, lame ass pandemic and we can't go anywhere. You can't so, go to the library. So has it affected you by not being able to go to the library and writing at home more, or have you adapted to writing at home more? Um, I've, I've, I, you know, you do what you have to do. Um, but I, I, I can't wait to go back to church. I, I miss the library for sure. What do you do when you get writer's block? If you get it, it sounds like already taking breaks is a thing. So what else do you do? D- d- running. I, do, I, go, I go running and it's it, whenever, I mean, I hit the wall so many times, you know, you just are like, okay, well, I need this character to do this thing or I need this to happen. And how am I going to ever get her out of this and uh, go for a run and somewhere around the second mile, you sort of, you, you figure it out. I also, I listen to music when I run, like I may, I make a playlist. There's definitely, there is a playlist for anything I'm working on. And so you listen to the same song over and over and over on Let Him Go. It was Prayer and Open D by Emmylou Harris. And that helped me without that song. I don't think I ever would have figured out the the very end of the movie. It's interesting because it is psychosomatic to an extent. I've, I've heard some writers talk about trying to use the exact same music every time on a certain project, or as you just said, a playlist, because oh. it helps them get into the headspace that they're in during that yes. project. Yeah. Would you, would you say that's it? completely no you it's you know you're you this is the world you're in and um yeah it's a way of invoking it right how long until your first draft what is it six to 12 weeks kind of okay depends on what i'm doing yeah like once i really sat down and did it, it was pretty quick the first draft first draft was like six weeks you know, there's always the round of notes and depending yeah. if it's a studio project or, or if you're working with, you know, big talent, they're going to have mm-hmm. notes. What's it, what are some of the pratfalls and, and, and tricks that you've learned for navigating notes as a writer? Um, I, I don't know. I'm not very good. <laughs> the, um, the, you definitely have to, I mean, I, I like to, you know, you listen, I definitely want to improve it. For sure. Um, I wish I had more notes from actors, weirdly. Um, I kind of, I haven't gotten a lot of those. Um, the Because I like, I really love actors and I think they're super, like, I think they're super smart and I love their process. You know, I love, I love working with Paula Mazur because she's really great at story. And she has that a knack for, you know, when you're sort of, not fudging, but when, okay, it's okay. And now I'm going to move on to this other thing. You've sort of clipped a corner and she has a knack for being like, well, on page 18, this thing. And it's like, Oh God, she found it. Um, and so that's great. That's great. You want partners like that. You know, how hard was this to set up uh, once you had your script and, and you were in a place that you liked and you brought it out for casting, what was it like to get your budget and schedule? And what did your budget and schedule become? Yeah, um, it was actually pretty easy. We it was you know, but it's a, it's a we had three places that wanted to make it, but you know, if you get Diane Lane, if you get Ke- and Kevin Costner, then it's a go. And um, the trick on this was we focus features came on. I mean, it was just great. They were great. Josh McLaughlin was the executive. They leapt right on and. Um, the challenge was we had a very accelerated, so it was a 31 day shoot. Oh, wow. And it was an accelerated prep because we only had this little window because of Kevin's availability with, uh, Yellowstone. So, I mean, the, the prep was really, we didn't have enough prep time, but we, what was the budget? I don't even remember anymore. It, it was, let's say 15. It was something okay. like that. Yeah. Let's say 15. Um, Let's say okay. 15. <laughs> well, so, okay, folks, if you yeah. haven't yet seen Let Him Go, press mm-hmm. pause because we're going to get into the spoilers now. You could find Let Him Go anywhere that you would regularly watch a movie online. And, uh, you know, go check it out because we're now going to talk into the spoilers, into the story mm-hmm. dynamics. You know, I, I guess um, the, the first thing to talk about in the spoiler mm-hmm. section this is this is kind of that classic grandparents' rights story, you know. That's mm. that's the way that we would equate it in modern news times, in which yeah. child visitation is a thing. Because mm. basically, in this case, they feel that their grandson was kidnapped. But it's it's for a while a good back and forth about was he kidnapped or or you know like mm. did the dad just relocate the family in this new marriage? So yeah. 
I, I guess I guess one of the things to talk about early on is how much time you spend with the previous family. And I, I could see that being a debate for you. You do it in a series of montages in the opening of the movie in mm-hmm. such that we're seeing James, we're seeing Jimmy, you know, as an infant and, and what he meant mm-hmm. to his grandmother, Margaret, mm-hmm. and, you know, how Lorna and Margaret had a little friction. And then there's the sudden death. And yeah. then we're three years later and they're getting, you know, we think that they're dressing for the funeral after the sudden death. No, they're yeah. dressing for the marriage, which I thought was a really good transition. Yeah. And so it's it's interesting when Donnie comes about, was that section ever longer in your script? Was it ever shorter in your script? Because it, it seems like a good way to start to give people a baseline for what mm-hmm. they had before it was taken away from. from, from yeah. Um, it actually, what happened? It was shorter, weirdly, by, and it's, I think I, I, I the thing, the image that had always been in my mind was the baby in the sink and Margaret washing the ba- washing baby Jimmy. And in the first draft, that's how it started. And the horse comes back. And I saved the whole thing with James for later, but it doesn't really make any sense because I haven't shown you what's been taken from them. Um, and so... That was a quick, like, the, that was after the first draft, just the morning with James. And I love the, you know, it starts with the guy that dies, and then the next person is Kevin, who also dies. And so you're starting the movie with the two guys that don't make it. Um, and, but as a sequence, that, other than adding just that first little bit of the beginning, it never changed. Um, and, Yeah. It's it's interesting because the Margaret George relationship, mm-hmm. they have truly an idyllic marriage, a great partnership, and mm-hmm. they're thrown into a world of dysfunction. Yeah. And I'm I'm curious about how you how you parsed that the relationship because mm-hmm. you know Margaret has decided that you know after she sees Donnie you know hit the kid and hit the hit the mom mm-hmm. Jimmy and Lorna, she yeah. you know once they disappear she is ready to go on the road to try and at least reconnect but doesn't say out loud grab them back right and, oh no she's gonna get Jimmy she says it right I mean she says it but like you know you don't know how she's going to accomplish that and the legal ramifications but George right. is there like he George really doesn't argue it that much and they seem like they have a perfect partnership so what yeah. were, what were the challenges? Because when you have things yeah. that are so copacetic, sometimes people yeah. insert drama. So I could see mm-hmm. on the adaptation, you mm-hmm. pr- providing more friction between them. But to be honest, I'm glad that you didn't because it is yeah. a rare relationship to see what they have. And it, yeah. it seems like the world around them is the friction. It is. I, but there's a weird, I feel like they are, you know, there's this ghost of grief between them with the, with, the sun and and i think that the if the, if there is a point of friction between them i think it's that margaret's grief is so she's what would he accuse her of i'm not sure it, like maybe indulging her grief there's a, there's a this there's a scene where it's very early where they've dropped the grandson off at the at the new apartment and george comes into the kitchen and Mar- Diane Lane's character is standing at the kitchen sink not, and he can tell she's upset and he says, you know, he's not far and she says he's not here and turns away um, and you never see her face and for me that scene, it's George's scene and it's about a man who can't help his wife, like he can't reach her and she won't be comforted um, and so it was that was the thing that was interesting to me is that they are a couple, but they're handling this differently. And, um, and she's mad at him for not, you know, being more demonstrative about, you know, there are these subterranean things going on um, that are interesting to me. What were some of the left turns? What were some of the things that were never even shot, but parts of the book that you wanted to adapt that you never got to, or you cut out of your script oh. or ideas that you had that you abandoned yeah. again, not deleted scenes from the movie, early ideas that it could have gone this way, but then you learned a lesson. So it didn't. The only thing it, it really did not change very much. The only thing that um, I think my first pass at 
sort of the final nonsense at the house um, was a little more Tarantino-ish. And it, it sort of went on a little longer and Lorna got into the fight. And I just, looking it over, I felt talking about the like ending, it didn't make me talking about the ending now? Is that the Tarantino? The, the, the shootout at the house. Right, right, at the ending. Okay. And um, it just, you know, I called bullshit on myself and was just like, just come on now. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. Well, so yeah. what's interesting is, you know, for a while, the antagonist isn't clear at first, you know, their mm. son is taken from them. Then you think maybe it's going to be Donnie, um, mm-hmm. but we don't know really much about him at all. So you have yeah. that mystery of an antagonist and then they're mm-hmm. on their journey, mm-hmm. to see where it's going to take them. And they know that they're going to encounter somebody, but you know, nothing prepares us or them for Blanche. And right. so tell us about, kind of the slow reveal of Blanche, even through the dinner scene in which she tries to turn the table psychologically on them. Mm -hmm. She kind of acts like we're not doing anything wrong. You're kind of the invaders here. You've Mm -hmm. come to our house, you know, you're, you're on our territory and yes, it's your grandson, but it's, you know, my son who happens to be alive and we have every right. So there's just like an unraveling that happens slowly. But by the end of that scene, like, you know it's not going to end well. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> um, I think the, well, part of it was casting Leslie Manville as Blanche. You know, you have Kevin and Diane who are so great and, you know, Mon Pa Kent and they, you know, this wholesome George and Margaret, the Black Ledges. And what I love about Le- Leslie's, you know, one of the greatest actresses we have, but I wanted it to be, I didn't want you to know her that you, you wouldn't recognize Blanche. And so you wouldn't have an ex, you don't know like them, like they don't know what to make of her when you first come in. And that was critical to me um, that she not be recognizable. And I like that she, you know, she set, she set a trap and she's waiting for them. And this whole, thing with the lamp and all of this was in the script. I liked her that she's standing right in front of them, but they can't see her until she sort of shows herself felt great. Um, But the, one of the tricks was definitely um, figuring out what her grievance is because it wasn't in the book. It's not quite clear. And it, it, it sort of it came clear to me when I was figuring out writing the wedding when Lorna marries Donnie. And I'm like, OK, George and Margaret are there, obviously, to stand in for her. Where's his family? And his family can't be there because then they would have already met. And then when I realized that his own mother wasn't at his wedding, that was super interesting to me. And it was, that became, it wasn't the same way in the book. It's not in the book. It's sort of the book starts with the first 15 minutes of the movie are all backstory that has happened off screen in the novel. The the book starts with George coming home for lunch and Margaret's packed the car and she tells him what she saw. Okay. So it was just sort of that wedding sort of turned out to be the key. It was, it was super interesting to me about that Blanche is mad because she didn't get invited to the wedding and she blames them, which is so Rather much like my, it's so much like my dad's mom. <laughs> it's a real Midwestern kabuki theater, passive aggressive thing. Um, but then what was interesting, and I really want to give a lot of credit to Will Britton, who played Donnie, was he, being able to talk to him about what was interesting to me about Donnie, because Donnie on the page isn't much. Um, but that he, my feeling with Donnie was he, he had tried to escape his fate, which is that he's a wee boy. Like he wants to be a black ledge, but he's not, he's a wee boy. And he had tried to escape and she pulls him back. And, you know, in the novel word spoiler alert here, when right. The that, um, that in the, he isn't anywhere near the motel scene. Um, in the novel, it's Bill that cuts off George's fingers. And 
it was clear to me that Donnie had to be the person that does that. And it's Blanche who makes him do it because she knows he wants to be a wee boy. She, she knows that he wants, he likes George, that George, he want he wishes George were his father and she's got to punish both Donnie and the black ledges. And the best way to punish Donnie is to make him hurt a black ledge. Well, just because you jumped into it. I mean, it's also a moment of initiation. In which, that's it. You know, that's right. Blanche, that's right. Blanche is basically making him show his allegiance by committing a crime for her. No, he's you know? he's he, yeah. He has to. The, the initiation is great. He he has to make a choice. You're with us or you're against us. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine. You could find us over at backstory.net, and you could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app. Backstory. You know, if you've never read us before, the best way in is to check out our free issue. And uh, you could see so many cool things in there. We're the only magazine in the world that uh, publishes screenplays in their entirety and interview screenwriters about them. Not only do we interview writers, we interview directors, playwrights, novelists, comic book writers, actors, producers. There is so much to find in Backstory Magazine. So I really hope you check it out. One of the things I want to highlight that we did in issue 42, aside from our usual film and television coverage, was we we also have a section called Off the Shelf, and we publish screenplays that have never been seen before because they're unproduced by writers of note. In this issue, we have two. We have one by Simon Kinberg, the writer of X-Men Days of Future Past, and uh, he did a fantastic job with the first screenplay he ever sold called Ghouls of New York, and it's about grave robbers in the 1890s based on a true story. This was the first script that Simon sold. It launched his career. It's a cool script to read, and you know he still is cool to have it made one day, but it's a really good interview about what it took to get this script going for Simon and how his writing has changed over the years. The other script we have in our off-the-shelf section is LA-58 by Joe Carnahan. He he co-wrote it with his brother, Matthew Michael Carnahan. And Joe, of course, is going to direct it. And he's been trying to direct it for over a decade. He's getting really close. And one of the cool things Joe did was he also gave us concept art to run with the piece and, and, and storyboards. And it was it was just a cool piece. And it's, it's a fantastic script. So I know you'll enjoy reading that as well. Look, there's a lot of things to experience at Backstory. So I hope you check out our table of contents at Backstory story.net to read our free issue. And if you decide you like us, you could use discount coupon code save five to save $5 off a one year subscription. That'll give you access to all of our new stuff, but also our archive our archive goes back to about issue 29. And uh, we just published issue 42 and we got to keep adding new back issues to it, but it's a tedious process, but don't worry. We're going to keep doing it as we make sure to publish new content as well. So look, it would mean the world to me to have you as a subscriber to Backstory Magazine, so thanks for considering. But now, without any further ado, let's get right back into our interview, which, of course, if you're listening as a podcast listener in iTunes and Spotify, you could watch on our YouTube page for Backstory Magazine. We take these Zoomcasts, and we put them on YouTube, so you could watch us talk about these things as well. Um, but let's get back into our conversation with writer-director Thomas Bazooka about his latest film, let him go. The other thing that you said a second ago that I thought was interesting was you, you were kind of alleging like, what is Blanche's skin in the game? What is her grievance? You said, and yeah, it's fascinating because her, hers is the exact same as Margaret's. Technically, she just wants to keep her family together and no, she doesn't yeah. want Donnie to leave again. And she certainly yeah. isn't about to allow Lorna and Jimmy to leave on their own. Right. So it, it's kind of circular in that sense in which both grandmothers <laughs> kind of want the same thing. And and hey, and you, yeah. you could argue the way that she does that that George and and Martha are a little out of their their scope there by by showing up at someone else's house saying give us back our grandson but at the same time we know that that is the right thing to do in their case it is it's tr tricky I think the worst thing the Blackledges do in my mind is they show up to dinner without a gift <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like and it did it was like it, 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 I did think about it all the time when we were shooting I was like should they they should bring something, but it didn't make sense for them to bring anything to dinner. Like they've been told they're going to dinner, bring something. But yes. um, what was interesting to me, and it didn't, it didn't occur to me until we were shooting and it was, and it was Leslie in the kitchen and she, and it's a line in the book. Um, she says to Margaret, when she meets her, she says, you're the grandmother. And Margaret says, I am. And it wasn't until I heard, it really wasn't until I heard Leslie say, you're the grandmother and the inflection she added to it, that I realized she is not a grandmother. Leslie, the Blanche character, and that 
is probably her greatest grievance is that she has, she's surrounded by these useless men, her two lunkhead sons, this bill character, her son, Donnie, and they're useless to her because they have not had children. And she, wait, wait, wait sorry. He, I'm, I missed what? this. I think I missed this. Is Bill not her son? No, he's her um, brother-in-law. Oh, I did not realize that. It's okay. It's a super subtle thing. I it's thought he was super... one of the crazy sons too. Okay. No, no. Um, but he, no, he said, he talks, to, he's, he mentions uh, Donnie's his nephew. Got it. Um, That's right. That's right. When they first, but it, it, it doesn't matter. But I, but it was interesting. You know, she's, you're introduced to Blanche by this long monologue about her. It's about legacy and bloodlines. And she's stuck with these guys who can't give her what she needs, which is to keep the line, the bloodline going. Um, so it's why she's, and it's making her crazy. Right. And so by, by impressing all of their legacy onto Jimmy and making him a screw up just like they are, that's like Blanche's last hope as well. Yeah. I also think she's just a, you know, she's like the ball fell into her yard and she's going to keep it. Yeah. Is also Absolutely. part of it, right? Yeah. That's a good way to describe it. You know, Peter's yeah. an interesting character, uh, the, the Native American teen. Mm who, mm -hmm. you know, talks about an identity crisis. And it was really interesting because you were talking about this mm -hmm. wild backstory where the government ripped him away from his family mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. enough time had passed that he had lost track of Native mm -hmm. American languages. So he couldn't mm -hmm. reconnect with his grandmother and the legacy of that family. T tell us about the creation of Peter, because it was it was an interesting character. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing he's in the book, but how he yeah. functioned in your story, I'm curious about as well. Sure. No, it's 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 great. And I'm, and I'm thrilled to talk about it because I he is in the book, um, but his backstory, he has no backstory in the book. He's just sort of this person out there. And like, you never, you knew yeah, that he had an aunt and uncle in town and they sell skins for him and that's all you get. Um, and he, and sort of the description of his shack. And I went back and forth and, you know, my first reader is Jeff Ford, my editor of the of three films. And, and we kept going, I was like, do I need him? Do I need, like, I don't want him to be the magical person of color who helps the nice white couple. And that's not like, it makes me itchy. But I felt like there was something in my heart that said he, I needed to have him because he's the, he is, I love that he's sort of this, you know, out in, they want, they cross paths in this limbo. And he is the ghost of their son. He's, you know, possibly what could happen to their grandson. He's a lost boy. There's a lost horse that has found him. And I felt like in the, you know, this vortex of, you know, the world, they found each other. And um, so I, I hung on to him. But then I felt like, okay, if I'm going to do that, I need to tie it together. And um, read a lot of, you know, I knew about the Indian schools and did some research on that. And that would, and that sort of made it compelling to me. You know, Lorna as a character, there could be, yeah. you know, a version where she's just too passive and she's yeah. just kind of, you know, the rag doll being torn back and forth between these two <laughs> yeah. families. But here, you know, it's interesting because she has a spark to her and mm -hmm. She essentially doesn't get along with either of her mother-in-laws. She's, she, she's been cursed a bit with both of them. Yeah. And it's fascinating because, you know, rather than just being the grateful mom of like, oh, gee, thanks for all your help. Like, you know, she she spits fire back even at Martha, even when Martha's yeah. trying to help her. And I, I'm curious about the challenges of writing that character and keeping yeah. Lorna, you know, three-dimensional rather than just a cliche. Well, I, you know, did she, I, well, and she did change a little bit from the book. She's a little, Donnie doesn't hit her on the street. He just hits the kid and she laughs. And so you're like, wait, she what? Laughs, really? Yeah. And so that I didn't want. Um, uh, I, you know, Kaylee had a big, she's great. Kaylee Carter, who plays her mate. I mean, she, I'm, you know, I'm coast, I'm, I'm coasting on her coattails in, in that she makes that character something good. Um, what I always felt bad for Lorna because she's sort of, it's like out of the frying pan into the fire, which, you know, mother-in-law do you want? Um, like it wasn't great with Margaret and like Margaret was in love with 
her own son. And so it, there wasn't much room for Lorna. And I felt like, well, what were her, all I knew about Lorna, which was compelling to me from the book is that she didn't have a family of her own. That was a line in the book. And I thought, okay, you're in Montana in 1961. What are your prospects uh, as a, you know, a girl who was who, who, you know, was she raised by a stingy aunt and uncle who, you know, she couldn't wait to get away from. And how did, anyway, um, there's, there was a little bit in the diner scene. It's just a little rondelay that got cut of Lorna talking about why they came, why she and Donnie came and that they, they were supposed to live in town and that that was what they'd been promised or that's what the wee boys had said. And I, it just, it, the scene needed to move along, but I, what I liked about it was it spoke for me, it spoke to Lorna's, I always felt like Lorna, if she, she just, it, the problem for Lorna was that she was wrong, born at the wrong time in the wrong place, that she sort of had maybe more sophisticated aspirations than anybody around her. Um, that she should have been in, lived in town. Maybe things would have been better. I I thought it was interesting. It just I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it just caught me as like, yeah. well, they're they're traveling. They ask, you know, like a a good cop that you know they were talking to a good place to yeah. to sleep, yeah. and he's like, well, if you want clean, sleep here in the jail, and they do. And I'm like, right. what? Like, where did that come from? I'd never heard of that before. Isn't it weird? I it, I know, and it's it's in the book, and it it gets a laugh. Like we had one test screening, and it gets a laugh, and it's sort of weird, and you don't know quite what to make of it. But I I love that it was in the book, and it's it said something to me about sort of the the you know the fraternity of lawmen and their families, and that. Margaret's not put off by it and they're sort of humble people. They, the, the, yeah. So it, it, it is a right. weird thing for sure. Um, but I, I, it was, a, it was an interesting detail. We, we covered the motel scene a little earlier. What was your biggest yeah. challenge directorially in the motel scene? Cause you have a lot going on. You have a fight, you have a lot of characters, a small room and yeah. you know, a hand, you know, fingers getting cut off with a hatchet. Yeah. Yeah. That was the what, what 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 was the question? Sorry, you're just your biggest challenge directorially in that scene. Um, choreography, and then sort of figure it. It was definitely just the blocking, and it, I think it took us a day of rehearsal to figure out exactly what all of that was going to be. Because I wanted to move them around the room. I loved we added that mirror over the desk helped enormously in or in keeping track of people, um, and. Uh, and then I think that the challenge was, uh, was uh, around just executing the scene and figuring out how to break it. I had to do the same thing with the, with the kitchen table scene. Um, and in the motel, it was like, I wanted to run the scene up until the point George goes into the desk. Cause then I've got blood and, I didn't want to have to redress that a bunch of times. So we broke it down into three acts and sure sh shot it over the course of a day and a half. And then I do the same thing with the kitchen because you can't have, you can't have smoking around a kid. And so I shot everything toward Blanche's end of the room without the kid with her smoking and then brought the kid in for just, and it's also, you have kid hours so you've only got the kid for, you know, he turns into a pumpkin. So it was, it was boarded in such a way that it, it's three acts and you only have the kid for the, the, for the third act. How many cameras were you shooting with? Um, it was always two. Okay. And for a couple things, it was three, but always two. Obviously there's this big ending where George yeah. makes the decision after his fingers are cut off, you know, to go back and to rescue the kid from this dangerous, you know, environment. And he knows yeah. that it might not be something that he's going to walk out of. Like he knows there's yeah. a risk. He doesn't have a weapon. He's lost yeah. fingers. He's still in recovery. And yeah. it's, it's an interesting scene. And Martha chases him and, you know, they reunite. Tell me the challenges of, of shooting that big house fight, because you, you have, you have motion on the stairs with gunfights. You have mm -hmm. the house on fire. 
And then, mm-hmm. you know, my favorite shot in the movie is when, when mm-hmm. George, you know, when, when Martha finally shoots Blanche, <laughs> he falls into this door that opens to show the entire rest of yeah. the house on fire that yeah. was just smoking behind the door. So it was, it was just a really cool, cool scene, but I'm sure logistically there was, there was a lot going on behind the scenes there. Yeah, you know, you break it down. Um, the, the the hardest part was time. We definitely did not have enough time and certainly did not have enough time for the last sequence downstairs. Um, it was because it's really, I've got the bedroom, then you have the arena of the upstairs yes. hall and the kid and the kid going over the banister and then and then Margaret coming in, going upstairs again, and then the downstairs part. So it, it was it was all storyboarded. I want to give credit to Leslie for it, it was the first time she she loved it. Like she just she'd never held a gun before. She was into all that. We had squibs on her back. She was very excited. And you know, sixty three year old actress falls backwards into a burning kitchen, which it was on fire. I just, you got to give her props for sure. It was, um, but the, you know, one of the things that was interesting was the first day of shooting, we shot um, the scene where they put the horse down and which is used in the motel thing. It's the dream Kevin has right before that. And he and Diane had this impulse to walk away at the end of the scene. And I'm thinking, well, we're never going to use it because I'm going to cut out before he shoots the horse. So I don't know why we're doing this, but something I was like, okay, I'm going to follow this impulse. And as they were walking away, I was thinking, that's it. That's the end of the movie. That's how I get her out of the house, which is you don't see her leave the house. Um, It's you stick with him and then it's the burning house. Cause my thing was always the, the house, and that was my big thing was we had to build a house to burn it down. Like, I, you know, the number of times they told me what, you know, oh, what you can do with CGI. And I, and the issue for me, the Wee Boy house burning down isn't about the end of the Wee Boys. It's George, it's you're sending George on his way. It's his right, Viking like funeral. Yeah, yeah, it's his Viking, Viking funeral. funeral. So you essentially and, just built a big exterior that you could burn down and your interiors were all shot in different locations. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And and it, and it looked great. I mean, also you were saying again about the horse being put down. Yeah. Thematically, what was so great is the recall of that in which yeah. she explained earlier what what did she whisper to the horse and she talked about good times to send mm-hmm. the horse on its way right before it was going to die and then that's yeah. something that she does with George as he's yeah. dying. So, I thought it was a good recall there. And Thanks. I'm just curious, was there anything different about the ending that you toyed with because technically the women aren't in the house? For for you know those final moments, Lorna's not in there for any of it. Her and Jimmy got a well in the in the book. Margaret is about twenty miles away. Oh, okay, yeah. So, I mean, do you do you see the law coming after them after the events of the movie, or it seems like they have even oh. accountability as to what happened, and it could all be pinned on. Well, we don't know what George did, and we'll never know. I know. I th- I think that there was. Um, well, this is going to just, you don't want to go on this deep dive with me, but the, there was a little bit of a thing where, um, and we kind of, we cut it, but in the scene in Peter's shack, when she's sort of lost her mind and George is just deciding to go get the wee boys, um, there was a thing where she said, okay, we'll go, but let's just keep driving. And I can't go home. There's nothing for us there. We'll keep going. Maybe we'll go see an ocean. Like we could go to California. And so for me, the idea was always that they would, I, I never thought that they were going back to the ranch. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, but I also did, part of me also felt like Blanche was probably the wicked witch of the West and all the, all the foot soldiers she had in town were probably going to be relieved that she was dead. Right. Like the cop that came and visited. They're not going to, they're not going to go They're They're like, Oh, thank God. Somebody dumped a yeah, bucket okay. of water on her. <laughs> well, so, you know, what was your toughest scene as a writer and as a director on the page? What was the scene you grappled with the most and how do you creatively rise to the challenge? And then as a director, what was your, your, mm-hmm. your toughest scene as well? I don't know. I think the end, the end was definitely the, cause it's not in the book is so. And it, none of the end is in the book. None of, none of the things that go on in the house. George goes and he gets and says to Lorna, go out the front door. And she runs down. She's not stopped by anybody. And 
as she's leaving, he has set a fire. And as she's leaving, she looks back at that. She's running away from the house and he, she looks back at the house and sees a figure bring a chair out and sit down on the porch facing the door. And so it's, you assume it's George with a shotgun and he's going to kill the wee boys as they come out of a burning house. But I felt like I needed to deliver on all of that. And so, wow, so it was the invention of him dying and everything else was, was all you. Yeah. That's and, great. and, um, you know, dispatching Blanche, like, it, like I really had to figure out, Oh my God, like <laughs> when you sit down and you realize, okay, I have to kill five people. Yeah. Okay. How am I going to do this? And um, just figuring out that choreography um, and then working with Trevor Smith, the production designer who really solved it for me. I, this is going to seem like a small thing, but it was a big thing that the stairs actually don't go toward the door, but from upstairs empty into the center of the house, as opposed to out the front door, which was critical um, in making it more difficult to get them out. And it's That's an old awesome. Sears Roebuck catalog house um, was the was the floor plan. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, so I know we're running out of time. Last question. Yeah. What's next? Uh, you know, I'm doing another sort of a, kind of a Woody Allen-ish family stone New York thing. Um, but then this adaptation I did of The Good House, uh, which Maya Forbes and Wally, uh, her husband, directed, um, which Sigourney Weaver and Kevin Klein are in. That's great. That's yeah, great. Well, yeah. look, you've been very generous with your time. I dug your oh, home. Oh, thanks. And uh, hopefully it won't about. be so long until we talk again. Tom, thanks for I promise. Time. I promise. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to writer-director Thomas Bazooka for being so generous with his time and coming down to chat about his latest film, Let Him Go. And you know, look, if you haven't seen it yet, I hope you go check it out. Thomas made a lot of interesting choices in his adaptation that makes it different from the novel. So there's a lot to see there, as you heard us just discuss. And I hope you check out and support his film as well. And speaking of cool things to do while you're surfing around online, I also hope you check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You know, you could read us on a desktop or laptop or through our iPad app, Backstory. If you've never read us before, feel free to test drive us by reading our free issue, which you could do over there. And look, if you like what you read, I hope you consider becoming a subscriber and you could use coupon code SAVE5 to save $5 off a one-year subscription by using code SAVE5. That'll save you $5. So look, it would mean the world to me to have you as a subscriber. So thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021 all rights reserved. And folks, if you want to reach out to me, I'm a pretty easy guy to find. You can find me on Twitter as Yo Goldsmith, or I also run the backstory underscore mag account for the magazine. You could also use those same uh, handles over on Instagram, Yo Goldsmith or backstory underscore mag. And I promise to use Instagram more this year. I know I got really bad about it. I also have a Facebook fan page. I don't use it that often, but I'll try and stop by a little more often this year. You could always email me, yogoldsmith at gmail.com. I absolutely promise not to respond immediately, but I will try and get back to you when I can. Just don't be mad if you don't get an instant response. I'm an easy guy to get a hold of. So look, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week. <laughs>